here to share with you more information about uh, the Zeitgeist Movement. So um, I invite you now to welcome Frankie here for TZM Understandings. So thank you very much and uh, I really appreciate and first of all thank you Casey and the whole Australian chapter for establishing this here. It's really beautiful, you're an amazing chapter, lots of intelligent, beautiful, positive people, I love it and this applause goes for you. So let's start with my presentation. My name is Frankie Miller, as Casey just introduced me. I coordinated the German-speaking chapter since summer um, 2009, um, and the title of my talk is actually TCNM Understandings. As I intend to summarize some of, the per of my personal experiences while outlining what the movement is actually is all about. I'll start with a, with a basic definition regarding what TCDM advocates, and giving this is just a short talk, I will focus on three core attributes of it. The Zeitgeist Movement is a global sustainability activist movement presented in the case for the needed transition out of our current unsustainable economic model and into a new sustainable socio-economic paradigm based on using the best that science and technology have to offer to maximize human, animal and environmental well-being in accordance with the natural world. For a deeper understanding of this description, we'll, we'll first need to analyze the reasons why our current economic model is unsustainable. And in the second section, we go through the necessary tools for change of the current situation. And finally, in the third, I will conclude with the different attributes of our activism to help achieving this goal. So let's begin. Meaningful change is not possible if you don't understand what the problems are in the first place. So why is our current economic model unsustainable? Well, first of all, at its core, it is based on narrow self-interest that comes from our current model's use of a competitive economic system. Followed to its logical conclusion, with everyone driven to act for their own self-interest, how can this ever lead to the betterment of society as a whole? Unfortunately, this isn't working. Most modern economics do not recognize this, Competitive, self-interest-oriented form of economics is really just a byproduct of scarcity or perceived scarcity. And because of this, we are trying to outdo each other in order to survive. Until self-interest at the core of our economic system becomes social interest, nothing will change. This competition is often thought as natural, as it certainly does appear to be when observed in the natural world. But this behavior is only engaged in when it needs to be, and mostly due to the scarcity of something. But in modern economics, you have this principle of constant open competition, hence open warfare built in explicitly, where you have individuals competing against each other for work, corporations battling each other for market share, and governments competing against each other for economic and political dominance. How can anyone expect there to be a balanced, peaceful, sustainable, and productive coexistence from such a thing as this. Can it be really deemed as healthy to win at the expense of others? Another metaphysical manifestation of this competitive scarcity orientation is that of property, which is the basis of our current monetary market system. The nonsensical nature of this idea was outlined well by Native American people who, when faced with the claim, this apple tree is mine, would have laughed and asked, how can you claim property on something that nature provides? You don't take any influences on, this, on these growing processes of these apples with your privatization. So let's analyze where this word is coming from. The root of the word private is Latin. It literally means bereaved, deprived, robbed, or stripped of something. So if you privatize this planet and bereave, deprive, and rob each other, does that sound particularly sustainable to you? I think not. And last but not least, our current global economic model is unsustainable because it's based upon the core driver of this rewarded scarcity competition. It's actually money. Whilst the invention of the social convention called money was once useful, it has now outgrown its usefulness. As soon as it's introduced in any given society, it is used as a commodity that has detrimental effects. For example, money is created out of debt with interest applied, which creates pressure. 
as there can never be enough to pay off the outstanding interest. This debt for more debt cycle has huge consequences for people and the environment, which I will outline in more detail later on. Second is, the use of monetary practice can be seen to generate corrupt behavior. No matter how would you, you would like to reform a monetary system, it's difficult to divorce the aspect of corruption from this profit incentive and wealth accumulation that are inherent to the monetary system. Money appears to be one of the most corrupted mediums ever invented. Thirdly, money lowers relevant education, as it is totally decoupled from the natural world. By simply being a token gesture of what we perceive valuable, money masquerades around the world as a sound economic tool. This expression of all qualitative differences in terms of how much money has become the common denominator of all values. It hollows out the core of things, their individuality and their specific value in natural life cycle of needs. A way of summing it up is that nowadays people know the price of everything but the value of nothing. In this constant fight against each other in order to obtain this medium of exchange, only few know actually where money comes from. And you can ask your friends and relatives and most won't be able to tell you. And this is what I mean with relevant education, whereby people have totally forgotten that money is actually an illusion and only nature and its laws are real. Number four is that money helps to create and maintain power structures, hence elitism, which is, a, which is actually a byproduct of competition where you have winners and losers. Just do the equation. If money is a medium to get access to things, then money equals power over others. So the more money equals more power. Combined with the concept of property and the fact that it's easier to make more money if you already have some money, this results in inequality and structural violence, which is what we see today on a widespread scale. With number five, you can see money itself can be accumulated. What is actually a manifestation of an unnatural activity, dehumanizing those who practicing it. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, used to call this crematistics, the art of acquisition, which is completely different from the root definition of economics, meaning the management of a household. To economize should mean increasing efficiency, hence the absence of waste. Economics should therefore be the art of living and living well and leaving enough left for others. This definition of economy is important to appreciate. As instead, of, as instead of a proper scientific analysis of the resources needed for this intelligent management of a household, modern economics unfortunately utilizes money. But money cannot be a resource, nor does it represent them. If it were, then we wouldn't see the waste we currently are on a global scale. But today, it's all about tracking money sequences and so-called cost efficiency rather than technical efficiency. It as though the ever-increasing speed in circulation of money is equated with societal progress. The truth is that inefficiency and scarcity are the main drivers for profit, since you can make money out of problems. And this increase in the capacity to produce goods and services is then called economic growth, which is in real terms an increase in inefficiency. The math is pretty easy to work out. We live on a finite planet with finite resources, but our economy requires infinite growth and constant consumption. Quite obviously, this is not sustainable. <laughs> this form of economics is actually an anti-economy. As it is so fundamentally disconnected from the real world, it is destructive for our planet habitat. I hope you now have a better understanding of what today we laughingly refer to as economics cannot coexist with an access abundance, high efficiency, or environmental preservation. We need to move out of our current unsustainable economic model. So let's now focus on the second core section where we use the best that science and technology have to offer. And let's outline the necessary tools for change. As you know, you first need to be aware of a problem before you can seek any solution to it. 
So awareness and education are the first step to change our current socioeconomic model. This is why TZM has to focus on education and communication as a global movement. It's a massive awareness campaign to address these fundamental issues before it's too late. Our intent is to spread awareness, including the use of educational materials, programs and events, with the aim to express the incredible potential we have as a species. We also differ from established approaches of societal change in our, in, the, in our method we use, which is scientific instead of religious or political. Just ask yourself, does it really change the problems of society if you just sit there hoping, wishing, praying? Or how can, be, how can a politician without any sociological background solve societal problems? What if instead we applied the same methodology that gives us our amazing scientific breakthroughs to society itself? Wouldn't that make more sense as a collective decision-making process? I think yes. The question should no longer be who makes the decision. It should be about by what, by what methodology are decisions arrived at. It's not about a loyalty to peoples, groups or ideologies. It's a loyalty to methodologies that have stood the test of time. Therefore, the second tool of our educational intent is the application of the scientific method for social concern. The third tool is really an example of our scientific breakthroughs, which is technology. As it reaches from the sticks we use to make firewood to the invention of the wheel, and if you wear clothes, shoes, or glasses, that's technology. It also extends from the electricity we use to light a bulb to the, to the internet we use to connect each other, to communicate, and to educate ourselves. In general, it's unnecessary to protest against new, new technology, as it is a result of our ability to innovate. Technology can help make life more easier, simpler, and better for people. It's a wonderful tool. But also, if used incorrectly, it's a horrible tool. Technology should only improve our lives, but not become our lives. So it's therefore very important to differentiate between technology itself, itself and the use of it. Within the monetary market-based economy, technology isn't used to better everyone's life or to maintain the environment, but rather to mostly maintain power and create profit. So it's the abuse and misuse of technology that should be our major concern, not technology itself. Or as the Dr. Martin Luther King pointed out, when we look at modern man, we have to face the fact that modern man suffers from a kind of poverty of a spirit, which stands in glaring contrast to his scientific and technological abundance. We've learned to fly the air like birds. We have learned to swim the seas like fish. And yet, we haven't learned to walk the earth like brothers and sisters. To conclude our second section of this talk, if our values are not in, not in accord with what can create true well-being, then clearly we cannot expect to move forward with transformative technological changes. Which brings me to the last section of our general statement. As this value change is actually the basis for our activism, here are some of the attributes of it. The first is that TZM, as an activist movement that it is, is an encompassing entity of a train of thought which respects underlying causal scientific principles. This train of thought is logically self-realizing and self-reflecting, as you can compare it to the decision to stay healthy, based on the logic that poison your food will harm you. The movement follows this self-generating premise of understanding, and this is why it operates in a holographic manner with this simple train of thought as the origin of influence for our action. The train of thought also expresses the general logical basis for a more scientifically oriented social system. And this is a very advanced way to look at any kind of social organization. Which brings me to the second attribute of our activism. By addressing the, root, the true root causes of our, of our societal problems, hence the logic for their resolution, the movement proposes a solution in this regard. This solution is actively derived from direct physical reference to the governing scientific laws of nature. It can therefore be called a natural law resource-based economy. 
As it is important to understand that everything in life is in natural progression, this new social system would be adaptive and emergent rather than static and fixed. This understanding has been influenced by many great thinkers, but one of them, the great author, designer and inventor Buckminster Fuller, once stated, Nature is a totally efficient, self-generating system. If we discover the laws that govern this, the system and live synergistically within, the, within them, sustainability will follow and humankind will be a success. And I can see lots of intelligent and outspoken activists and institutions, figures out there, seeking what they call change. But to me, opinions without solutions are like a car without fuel and a driver. It's not enough to criticize society without offering a workable alternative. Instead of protesting, complaining, and demanding, we are advocating, proposing, and promoting a natural law resource-based economy as a workable solution. And the third attribute of our activism is empathy, as it is necessary to collaborate, communicate, and cooperate with each other to achieve global sustainability. Empathy is the capacity to place oneself in another's position. It's about caring for other people and having the desire to help them. With the understanding that people are shaped by their environment and culture, it is important not to judge others, but rather to attempt to understand what made them that way. Our activism also includes nonviolence in mental and physical form, and hopefully humor. The legendary musician and peace activist John Lennon nailed it with his quote, when it gets down to having to use violence, then you are playing the system's game. The establishment will irritate you, pull your beard, flick your face to make you fight. Because once they've got you violent, they know how to handle you. The only thing they don't know how to handle is non-violence and humor. Humor, which hopefully includes the ability to laugh about yourself. And the parable will describe the fifth and final attribute of our activism. A guy who treats his body like a trash can goes to the doctor because of not feeling well. The doctor analyzes him with scientific methods and concludes that the guy is going to die if he doesn't change his ways. As a reaction, and in his frustration, the guy attacks the doctor for this conclusion and message as he never thought about uh, his eating habits and that his even eating habits could have such a traumatic effect. After all, he grew up this way. The doctor advises him to a more healthy diet and to go to the gym to get in shape and his health back. This seems as a radical shift for the patient, but after reflecting that the consequence was to die, he decided to follow the doctor's advice. Emotionally driven, he goes to the gym, started running as fast as possible, and then he lifts a 100-pound weight and hurts his back, and he goes home like this. So what do we learn from this? Despite having the best intentions, the guy should have used the 10-pound weight, go to the gym every day, and build up to it. The more often he would go, the more easy the change would be, and he would eventually achieve his goal. My point here is that persistence is key. Patience is not a virtue. In our activism, it's a necessity. Our understanding is that the grass doesn't grow faster if you pull on it. Personally, I'm very influenced by Gandhi's quote who said, strength does not come from physical capacity. It comes from indomitable will. And this concludes some of the attributes of our activism to create a better understanding of it. Our rent to share knowledge and uplift others is not always easy to pay. You are seeking to improve yourself and your understanding at great cost to your own time and energy. But still, people often resist you with every ounce of strength and call you foolish for not embracing your ego in giving way to immediate gratification. Be sure that I'm aware how hard it is, and I totally understand the challenge of this important progress, as I'm in it as well. So, you, so you're really not alone. History will likely never know our names, but at the end of the day, we are the unspoken heroes of humanity, the ones who make the breakthroughs, the shift to paradigm, and create a prosperity we call progress. I hope with this talk, I have delivered a tiny fragment of the understanding of TCM so you can get involved to help supporting this important shift in human life. I also hope it was very helpful to understand this global sustainability activist organization called the Zeitgeist Movement better. 
And this was TZM Understandings. It's great that you all exist. Much love and respect. And thank you very much for your time. All right.